Welcome everybody to a brand new series, a brand new journey on the channel. It's NBA 2K25 and that means it's time for a brand new My NBA expansion series for the rest of the year. We are going to Mexico City, Mexico, a place that has been in talks by Adam Silver to be one of the next expansion teams in the NBA the past couple of years. They have high fan interest, a high population, and that's where we're going for the next 300 plus days. My name is Stumpy, welcome if you're new. I do CPU versus CPU rebuilds on NBA 2K, Madden, college football, and the show. So what exactly is CPU versus CPU gameplay? Well, it's this right here. It's watching games from a broadcast perspective and a broadcast style and watching the team that you signed, that you drafted out there on the court and less about my skill or lack thereof on the sticks with a controller in my hand. It's more about team building and putting the right pieces together and watching things unfold on the court yourself. We are the Aztecs of Mexico City with the red, green, and white colors from the Mexican national flag. And we join the Western Conference in the Southwest Division alongside the Memphis Grizzlies, the Dallas Mavericks, the Pelicans, the Rockets, and the Spurs who currently have Victor Wembanyama, a very up-and-coming, great young player. We're going to play our home games in the Palacio de los Deportes, otherwise called the Sports Palace, a real arena in the heart of Mexico City, and here is our court, a red apron, a green paint. That spot above the free throw line will be fixed once the game patches the lack of uh, no like colored paint inside of the free throw circle, but until it gets fixed, it's going to be tan for now. Here are the home uniforms. Tatum is the model, I guess, because he's the cover athlete. But you got the Aztecs wordmark across the chest. Both the neckline and the shoulders will have the red, white, and green stripe pattern. While the shorts will have that kind of flipped with green, then white, then red. We have the Aztec symbol on the center of the shorts with the green line going across. And on the sides of the shorts, we have the golden eagle symbol. We are going to wear green away from home with the Mexico City word mark outlined in white and colored in red. Same goes for the numbers on the front and the back. We'll have the red, white, red neckline and shoulder lines with those stripe patterns on the shorts as well. We have the white Aztec symbol on the shorts, same line going around the entire waist, plus the same golden eagle symbol on the side of the shorts. Then. My favorite uniforms of the bunch are the City Connects, the Ciudad de Mexico, wordmark across the chest, just a simple blood red and jet black color scheme. And you of course have the Aztec kind of canine symbol on the shorts too, inside of the shoulder and short stripes along the sides of the uniform. In my settings, I'm going to protect 10 players prior to the expansion draft because the AI for 2K does a pretty horrible job at protecting the right players for a lot of different teams. If you were to choose eight here, then you would have a lot of like fringe star players be available when they really should not be. And even with 10 players being protected, it's still going to leave you with a couple of pretty great options to select. And this year, a new feature being added is the ability to watch the FIBA tournament unfold. So if we have players in that tournament, then we'll definitely jump in for those couple of games um i believe in the off season well that will take us to the expansion draft and like i said even if you protect 10 players there will still be way too many good options here like these top four guys make no sense whatsoever like van vliet being available on a 43 million dollar salary just does not check out and og and josh hart would definitely be protected by the knicks like almost assuredly and so would quickly buy the Raptors, so I'm not going to pick any of those top four players. But our first pick will be the Time Lord, the 6'9", Robert Williams at center. He's the first overall pick of the draft. And now for pick number two, we're going to select Malcolm Brogdon as our starting point guard here in year number one. Hopefully alongside Karis LeVert to be our two guard. Now for a small forward. I'm thinking about Derek Jones Jr. Played for the Heat, played for the Clippers, and now he's going to play for us. 
I would like Al Holford to retire as a Celtic in this series, so that's what's going to happen. We're going to take Dorian Finney-Smith here instead, and he'll have a player option going into year two. We will take one Celtic, though, and Peyton Pritchard as our backup point guard. We'll get Kennard from Memphis as our backup two guard, and we'll get Josh Green from the Hornets, who's only 23 years old after a couple of years with the Mavericks. We'll also take Najee Marshall, who currently plays for the Mavericks and now for us. And we'll get Steven Adams as our backup center to play behind the Time Lord. I also saw what Yabasele did in the Olympic Games. So he's going to join us from the Sixers after not even playing a single game for them. And we'll get GP2 from the Warriors to be some added depth at wing or as a guard. We'll get Javon Carter as point guard depth. And our last pick will be... Kind of a weird pick, but it's going to be James Wiseman. He's 23 and still has, I think, something to prove here. But he might not get a lot of playing time here in your number one. And a new feature also is that players can go on farewell tours. So Chris Paul, currently on the Spurs, will plan to retire and will, of course, go on a farewell tour here in year one. You probably want to watch a game against the Spurs some point this season. But our year will open against the Denver Nuggets. So here's our full roster. It's going to look about as you would expect for an expansion team, especially in their first season. No star players and mostly guys in their early 30s to late to mid 20s. And almost every player on a two to one year contract. After two years, we're going to look a whole lot different here. In terms of its size scoring, we have... A lot of players that can be at least decent in that regard, so that won't be a problem for us. We have DJJ and the Time Lord as our top inside scores with Brogdon and Wiseman close behind them. Mid-range scoring, more kind of a, mi of a mixed bag. You've got a couple of E minuses, a couple of decent shooters from those spots, and then a couple of C's and C pluses. So not the greatest area for our team, but I do think this team will thrive behind the yard because we've got Luke Kennard, Brogdon, Pritchard, Green, Marshall, all guys above B plus rating from behind the yard. Now badges do matter a lot more than just the attributes, but to have this many players this good from behind the yard, hopefully this will be good enough to get us one of the highest percentages from downtown in the league in at least our first season. Inside defense also is going to be kind of a plus, at least for our big men, not so much the rest of our team, but Williams, Adams, you know that they were going to be good in this area in terms of rebounding and inside defense. And Wiseman, GP2, both solid inside defenders as well. Elsewhere, not so much. So you kind of are counting on three to four guys to be those lockdown paint defenders for you. On the outside, though, we should be at least pretty solid again. Agility and badges matter a lot for this kind of a thing. But to have this many guys at B plus or higher is at least a really good sign for a team that needs to play good defense to win some games. Because offense is not going to be their strong suits. Playmaking might not be either. You have only one player that is in the A range and that's Malcolm Brogdon. Now even Peyton Pritchard as our backup point guard is going to have... A minus playmaking, only B plus for him. And then B minus for a couple other guards and wings. And then rebounding, of course, you got Adams and Williams and Wiseman. Our centers are going to have to carry this spot for us. Our forwards and guards will not be any good or any help here. So you're kind of relying on those two veteran centers to give you most of your offensive and defensive rebounds pretty much every single game and every single week. In terms of physicals, we don't really have the most athletic guys either. I think that Josh Green, Derek Jones Jr., and I was going to say James Wiseman, but that's probably for 2K24, not for 2K25. They'll probably be our best athletes on this entire team. But our biggest area of weakness is definitely going to be the intangibles and the basketball IQ. We have only three players over C+, which means that it's going to affect playmaking. It's going to affect smart rebounding, help defense. Pretty much everything is going to be worse because of the lack of IQ. So that definitely is going to hurt every facet of this team. In terms of salary cap, most players won't be on the roster next year unless we re-sign them. 
and we are five mil over the cap currently because we have six players right now over um, $10 million a year with three other guys coming in just below it, like $9 million per season. But again, at least half the team will be gone once we reach our first off season. So there's plenty of change in store for this roster outside of year one. And we're not going to spend too much time in year one because we're going to have about $100 million once we get to our first off season. So I'm kind of hoping to get there pretty quickly. In terms of staff, they've kind of changed things around. There's no more of like the like 17 of 17 available staffing spots. You just kind of have like bonus staff apply to a couple of positions. And right now that's going to be to our CFO and our head coach, Milan Mack, who was the head coach for my previous team as well. So I guess it's just the same guy that you have to hire. But he doesn't have the best offensive or defensive coaching skills, which it's definitely a problem for a team that needs better coaching to overcome their own uh, lack of intangibles. And he's got four bonus staff currently for him. We got three bonus staff for the head scout, Mitch Early, but he has pretty poor analytical skills. So we're going to have to definitely fire him by the end of this first season. And then as our team doctor, we've got Eddie Hughes, who also seems to suck at his job. So I see our staff, like our roster, changing a lot once this first year is all said and done. In terms of coaching, I'm going to go 11 deep here, at least during the, the regular season, because I want to get Yabusele some playing time as that 11th man off the bench. And I definitely want the time to start over Steven Adams, but you know these guys will all be getting about 20 or so minutes per game, or a bit more if you're a starter. There's no guy that really needs to play more than that because there's no star player currently on the roster. But we'll have uh, Adams, Pritchard, Derek Jones Jr., Kennard, and Payton off the bench with Najee Marshall getting replaced by Yabasele as that kind of sixth guy coming off the bench for our team, at least here in the first season. And for the sim points on the coaching side of things, I'm not going to change these until we see more of this team or even draft somebody in the next NBA draft. And I'm just going to choose a random playbook here and see where things go from there. We'll choose the next one for now and we'll change it as things progress. And same goes for the system. I think our best one is probably balance with two and a half stars. A couple of other ones are also two and a half stars, but I think, you know, balance makes the most sense for a team that doesn't really have too many strengths besides three point shooting. But even that will be kind of uh, affected by the lack of IQ. That will take us to a team scrimmage between Team White and Team Green. I can't choose the teams here, so right now we got Steven Adams and Robert Williams on the same team for some reason, alongside Karis LeVert, Josh Green, and Dorian Finney-Smith. They'll face Malcolm Brogdon, James Wiseman, Yabasele, Kennard, and Derek Jones Jr. With Team White currently up ahead 2-0. But I want to talk about my 2K23 and 2K24 series for a bit. So if you don't want to get spoiled for those, if you have not seen those and you want to, then probably just skip ahead by like two or three minutes. But I want to talk about the difference between how each and every series feels. Like back in 2K23, we had one of my favorite three-year stretches in the playoffs with the Vancouver Woodsmen, who were a Western Conference team. In that series, we had lost three straight years in a playoff series. And then we finally made the Western Conference Finals to face off against the San Antonio Spurs, who were our biggest rival in that series. And that first matchup went to seven games. We were trailing three games to one. We came back and won game seven to make our first ever NBA Finals. We played the Cavaliers in that Finals and came back from the unthinkable 3-0 deficit to win four games to three. Both series won by making in-game and pre-game adjustments. That was... One of the most memorable moments of my entire time doing these kinds of series. And then the next season, we faced the Spurs again in the Western Conference Finals. And they beat us in seven games this time and get revenge. The following season, we would sweep the Spurs in the Western Conference Finals in our final season and go on to sweep the NBA Finals 2-1, to one, our second Larry O'Brien Trophy. That three-year stretch was one of the most memorable of any series that I've played to this point. And it was very different from how our 2K24 series went. 
In 2K24, we had probably an equally memorable moment where we had the 10th best odds with a 3.4% chance to get the first overall pick in the lottery. And that was when a player named Mac Boyd was the consensus first overall pick with a LeBron James ceiling comparison. And then pretty much essentially the luckiest moments of my entire time playing any NBA 2K game, we got the first overall pick with a 3.4% chance. We drafted Mac Boyd and that completely changed the future of the series because the team was not looking too good uh, without a player of his caliber and he turned into one of the greatest players of all time. And uh, that's definitely an unforgettable moment for me. So. These past two years have been completely different series, and that's why I love doing this kind of a thing, because every year is completely different. Every series has so many different storylines develop, and you get so much satisfaction and enjoyment seeing guys that you draft meet their ceilings or get to their peaks that you thought they could become when you took them. It's kind of like in real life where GMs have high expectations for certain players, and eventually, and like, four, five, six years, they eventually reach their peak and lead teams to titles. That is the point of the series is to see the players that you draft or you sign become players that you thought could become the team leaders and lead your team to a title for the first time in team history. So that is the whole point of doing a series like this is to get to those satisfying moments and uh in every single year you have no shortage of those especially after the first couple of seasons let's shift our focus to the first draft class of this mexico city aztec series kind of a early preview to what's to come in this next off season the consensus first overall selection in the draft is dion york a power forward currently 18 years old has not played a college season yet and he's 6'11", but he is going to play for uh, for Washington. But he is the first overall pick across the board and the only player at a B overall or higher. Got a couple other players behind him and Anderson Longley, Aaron Mobley, who's a 6'11 center. They got John Kopp here at 6'6", who is a three-level scoring threat and can play the two spot or, or the three spot. Another forward here in Gabe Hayes, who is more of a just true wing and more of an inside scorer. Dusty Beasley, a 5'10 point guard, probably is not going to have a high ceiling here with that height. And then Jackson Larson, a 6'4 forward slash two guard, a point forward, mostly according to his profile. Outside defender Frank Winston at 6'6 and 20 years old. Most of these players are going to be in their 20 to like 21 range, but York obviously is going to go first overall because one, he's young, might be the youngest player in the entire draft. Plus, he has that insane overall compared to the rest of this entire draft class. Douglas Farrell is another forward, four inches shorter, not quite with that same floor as Dion York does. You got RJ Brooks at point guard. Ethan Love is a ball hawk, 6'6", 22 years old. We'll obviously learn more about these players as we scout them throughout the course of this first NBA season. But now we're going to close the episode by talking about my slider sets. This right here is the CPU versus CPU sliders for the actual gameplay. I'm going to use the same set I used to close my 2K24 series uh, because this gave us a pretty realistic feel and... This allowed a lot of players to score on their own in isolation and on plays drawn up, on backdoor cuts and things like that. So we'll start with this. We'll obviously tinker with this as we move through the series and see different things play out. And we'll probably have a different set by year two. For contracts, I do recommend increasing the salary cap inflation rate to 100 from, I believe, 50 because the game AI is really bad at curving the salary cap year after year so definitely change that and now for the difficulty settings for things like trading and simming games and re-signing players and things like that that's pretty important to keeping things realistic 
And I do recommend a game speed of 55 with those CPU versus CPU sliders because otherwise the game just moves way too slow and it's not as smooth as you probably want it to be. And I have commentary off because I'll be calling games myself, but that's really up to you. And then these simulation sliders, um, again, using the same set from 2K24 and we'll adjust it as we see fit. But typically, the game does not do a good job of giving you realistic stats compared to real life if you keep everything on default. So this set was actually very good for us in my 2K24 series. So, so we'll, we'll see how this one works out and we'll obviously make some adjustments. But that will kind of close the episode here, guys. If you enjoyed the episode and want to see more, please like the video, subscribe if you're new, and leave your thoughts down below on what you want to see in the future of the series. And uh, again, thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more. I'll have the first game up in a couple of days here soon. And uh, thanks for watching. Have a great day and peace out.